I must go punch that baby. Ever since her breakout performance in Superbad, Emma Stone's career has continued to blossom in the right direction. She's done a bit of everything – comedy, romance, drama, TV, musicals, even superhero movies. But I think the greatest accomplishment for any actor, aside from winning two Oscars, is earning the trust of the audience. Emma is one of the few actors of her generation that can make me want to watch a film just because she's in it. As ever since La La Land, I can trust that the project must have some creative merit for her to choose it, or at the very least, she'll be entertaining to watch. But with playing Bella Baxter, she took things to a new level, delivering what can only be described as a brave performance. By a brave performance, I mean that the role is going to require you to take unflattering dramatic risks that, if they don't pay off, could be quite humiliating. For instance, I would consider Keira Knightley's acting in A Dangerous Method to be a very brave performance, as she really does commit to the part in an admirable way, but something about it just doesn't really translate well on screen, and sometimes feels hard to watch. And in Yorgos Lanthimos's Poor Things, Emma Stone was going to have to take a similar gamble. Playing an adult woman with a baby's brain sounds like a potentially obvious mistake, and if so, the highly sexual nature of the story would only compound the problem. But with the right director at the helm, a fun script, and a standout performance, it's elevated to maybe the highlight of Stone's career to date. So let's take a deeper look at what made this wacky and absurd performance work so well. Let's start with the physicality of the character. A baby or a child doesn't yet know the rules of this world, they don't know how they're supposed to behave or the reasons why. Therefore they just do what feels good to them in that moment, their needs and desires come first. So while all the other characters around Bella are generally acting well adjusted and part of polite society, Emma ensures her performance stands out by not blending in. She sits with her feet up on the table, or on the piano, or she contorts herself into confined spaces. This doesn't just attract attention onto her, but by contrast, it helps to highlight the performative nature of polite society. In the beginning, everything she does is physically obnoxious, testing boundaries by knocking plates off the table like a disobedient cat. But what makes the performance endearing, as opposed to annoying, is how happy and proud of herself she looks as she creates chaos around her. At this stage of the story, Emma's performance needs to be completely primitive, as her character lacks all sense of self-awareness. Which is why when she sees her father figure God return home, she childishly jumps up on him, like a big dog that doesn't realise it isn't still a puppy. Although every good story causes their protagonist to change, Bella Baxter's physical and mental development is a cornerstone of what makes this movie work. Scene by scene, she's learning and adapting to the world around her, so Emma needs to find a subtle way of conveying this progression to the audience. In the beginning, everything needs to be a loud and clear physical communication of how the character feels, but by the end there's a clear contrast in how Bella physically expresses herself. For example, when she wants to leave Godwin's house and discovers the door is locked, she hits it, as in her underdeveloped brain, door not open bad. But at the end of the film, when she wants to leave the castle and discovers the gates are locked, we see her process this reality far more maturely. She has a deeper understanding of what's happening and just walks away, aware that physically expressing her disappointment is futile. When you think of an iconic character, there's usually something physical about the performance that you could instinctively do an impression of. Which is why Stone and Lanthimos spent a significant amount of time developing the physicality of Bella's walk. Given the character is so open and vulnerable, Emma has Bella walk with her hands by her sides, with no defensive body language whatsoever, and each step feels clumsy and somewhat unsteady, like she's still finding her feet. But even her walk evolves over the course of the story. In the early days, she's very off balance, as if she's walking on stilts. And Emma brilliantly displays these childlike wobbles that always feel like she's on the brink of falling over. This then progresses to a more stable yet still robotic walk, as if her shoes have weights in them and she can barely lift them off the ground as they march forward, giving the impression a strong breeze could knock her over. 
and by the end, her brisk walk now feels confident and stable. Her arms no longer hang aimlessly by her side, instead she swings them in motion to help propel her forward. So the character now physically looks as independent as she feels. The next key is conveying curiosity. Bella Baxter is discovering the world around her for the first time, which means that Emma needs to demonstrate a genuine fascination and wonder with everything she witnesses. Stone is uniquely capable of handling such a challenge due to her large and striking eyes, which she leads every investigation with, often not blinking for long stretches of time if Bella is captivated enough. Lanthimos puts equal focus on his leading lady's eyes, as not only are they a window into the character's inner process, but they tie into the movie's theme of looking at our world with fresh eyes. There's an infantile vacancy in her early expressions, whether she's slamming a piano just to make noises, or staring at a frog for the first time. These mannerisms were mostly improvised by Stone on the day, meaning that she was discovering Bella's true feelings and reactions in real time, just like the character was. She stated, A lot of the movements and motions and the way she eats and all of that was just us trying things on the day to see what worked. Bella has no inhibitions or sense of shame, which makes her reactions completely authentic, whether they're positive or negative. And this is where Stone's performance becomes more admirable, as she's willing to make a fool of herself and look unflattering to the audience. As like any child, Bella tests out her new discoveries by instantly putting them in her hands and mouth. And given she has no consideration for what other people think, her reviews are always ruthlessly honest. A performance like this demands full commitment, as if Emma held back in any of these moments to try to protect her image, it just wouldn't work, as we would see the performer's self-awareness underneath the shell of a character that's not meant to have any. But by playing it so raw and transparent, Emma allows herself to be seen and judged just as fearlessly as the character, which only makes her more endearing, as in many ways the audience can admire the straightforward nature of Bella. Which leads into the final key, her unique style of speech. The baby annoying, and the woman boring with words. Aside from putting on a British accent that's so consistent you forget her normal voice, Stone also has to deliver her lines in what is essentially broken English. And regardless of the depth or impact of her words, her tone remains deadpan and detached. As her character doesn't understand how or why she should ever couch her language, as that only increases the risk of miscommunication. So in a world filled with subtext and ulterior motives, Bella speaks with no consideration of anything but her intent to have her feelings known. And her broken, grammatically jumbled rhetoric belongs in the same family as Gollum or Yoda. You are sour faced, but I fixed you. Bella not safe with you, I think. It's hard to know who to give the most credit to here, as Poor Thing's script is written by Tony McNamara, based on a book by Alistair Gray, directed in Lanthimos' signature deadpan style, and also partially improvised on the day. But the film's dialogue is hilariously blunt from start to finish. Especially Bella's scenes with her male lovers, as their emotional displays and attachment are contrasted with Bella's blank expressions. But her ability to speak, just like her physicality, matures and develops over the course of the film. In the earlier stages, her language is primitive, with basic lines like no now or no never. Or she may refer to herself in the third person, like Bella not safe with you, I think. But let's look at how her vocabulary continues to evolve. By the midpoint of the film, she's now capable of telling Duncan, And your sad face makes me discover angry feelings for you which may still be grammatically flawed, but demonstrates that she has started to convey her emotions in a more colourful way, and her use of pronouns has advanced beyond referring to herself in the third person. And it can also be noted that Emma always delivers her sincere linguistic blows while maintaining strong direct eye contact, as if she's learning how to speak more effectively by visually inspecting the listener's reaction up close until her social education develops to the point she can now craft impressive descriptive sentences without any grammatical errors. Go home, Duncan. Our time has ended. I look at you and feel nothing but the lingering question of how did I ever want you? 
Emma Stone's fearless portrayal of Bella Baxter rightly earned her her second Oscar, as not only did she show herself in a light she's never revealed before, but she also allowed us to witness the character's intellectual evolution before our very eyes. As she transforms from a primitive yet curious infant that can barely walk straight, to a selfish sex-driven adolescent, to a confident independent adult with a thirst for knowledge all in one high-risk performance that could have just as easily damaged Stone's career as intensely as it's emboldened it. But by mastering Bella's bizarre physicality, unusual speech patterns, and striking curiosity, she unleashed an iconic performance that now impressively exists in a category of its own. Well, if you've made it this far, firstly, thank you for watching, but if you could now give the video a like, possibly even leave a comment and click on that subscribe button, it will encourage that mysterious algorithm to do its thing.